Okay, good morning and welcome. Uh, so this lecture is going to deal with uh, a continued discussion of chapter one, particularly as it flows into the issue of the two creations of Adam and Eve. The first creation happens at the end of chapter one on day six. And then all of a sudden, in the beginning of chapter two, we get a recapitulation of the earth in a mostly created, but not completely created state. Some things are still developing there. And then we get a second telling uh, of Adam and Eve, the, the story of their creation. You notice that even the very names Adam and Eve are not even used in uh, chapter one. So what, what what's going on there? And why, we try to ask the question, why is this story being told twice? Now, on one hand, we could say it's being told twice uh, if the story were the same and it were just a kind of repetition and reinforcement. But you notice that the story that's being told is not the same. And in chapter two, we are really getting a distinctly new story uh, with a distinctly different uh, set of implications for the nature of human beings, man and woman, husband and wife, Adam and Eve. Uh, and a different understanding, a different understanding of human nature, particularly in our relationship with the world, in our relationship with ourselves, in our relationship with each other, and of course to God. So in the next lecture, when we look at the fall, we're really going to touch on the transformation of those relationships because the fall signifies a fundamental transformation of all four of those relationships. But today, what I want to focus on is the way in which structure, starting with the structure of the whole cosmos, of the whole creation, the whole universe, uh, uh, it implicates the, the conflict and implicates the problem with human being or human nature. Because if we could say, uh, where does the conflict in the cosmos or the creation reside? It resides in the human being as opposed to anything else in the creation. And it resides in the human being precisely because human being is a special or peculiar type of being that is fundamentally different from anything else in the order of creation. And it's a double-edged sword. There is something tremendously positive, but there is also a problem. We are God-like, which is to say we we have a special dispensation from God. We're made, the, the Latin is imago Dei, we're made in the image of God. So it gives us an elevated status in the order of the creation. But simultaneous with that, we also have a power that no other being except God has, and we don't have it in the same degree that he has it, um, that is, create or creates, it is the distinctly human feature of human identity as compared to other beings, but it's also the problem. And what I'd like to demonstrate here is that within the order of creation, right, the very structure of creation is replicated in Adam and Eve. They serve then as a microcosm. A microcosm is a mini version of the entirety of the whole, the cosmos, or the, the universe of the creation. And therefore, it, the problem in them is really embedded in the whole structure uh, of things. In particular, we want to look at the relationship between the linguistic structure of the text, and it becomes very clear in, in Genesis 1, the structure of the text as it attempts to represent in language the physical structure uh, of the universe, and then the uh, psychological structure uh, of, of human beings, right? The distincting feature of a human being has to do something with their soul or their psychology or their mind being different than any type of being. Not only they they have a mind, and having a mind just dif differentiates them from any other order, uh, animal in the order of, of things. So, but what you'll notice is th the text tries to paint a picture in speech. And it does this by structuring the words in such a way as to literally try to replicate the structure of the cosmos. Now, there are two distinct features of the structure that really matter. And number one uh, is hierarchy, right? That things come in a certain order. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, right? Above and below. 
heaven and we should say the earth really becomes a stand-in for nature at large and heaven being this supernatural realm that's beyond the terrestrial realm of this world it's an otherworldly world that we don't have full understanding of but in that passage alone we have the establishment of this uh, dichotomy the fundamental dichotomy that will then be replicated in human nature as Adam is made from the earth he's extracted he's this clay or this dust and then the Spirit of God coming down from heaven is given to him and they are merged and they are mixed but they're like oil and vinegar they don't ever perfectly synthesize man is a and by which I mean human being human nature mankind right that's the way the word man is used in the text. So I'm going to use it that way so you understand what the text is saying. When the word is man, man is used by itself and it's not next to man and woman or it's not clearly indicated contextually, it means mankind, right? Uh, man is oil and vinegar. Man is the walking, I like to describe the walking conflict because of this tension in his identity. He has a dual identity in which no other being has this dual identity. Every other being is pure and simple, right? A rock is a rock. The moon is the moon. They do what they do. There's no internal conflict. But in man, there's an internal conflict, right? And that internal conflict is reflected right there in chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, because essentially man will be a mixture of heavenly qualities and earthly or terrestrial qualities. So we become, you could say, like the fly in the ointment, right? There's this perfect creation that's very good. And because of our freedom, we are able to deviate from the order that God has established. And one way to think of this is God is a watchmaker, right? And this, this was a common motif, particularly in the 18th century, when they saw... Um, Everything in the universe uh, functioning in terms of mechanical laws and like the first machines are really modern machines are really being built in the 18th. And then, of course, in the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution. Right. So everything they see in terms of mechanics and particularly, I mean, by the 18th century, watchmaking was at a very sophisticated state. And the watch becomes the kind of intellectual paradigm for um, the or the order of things. Right. So in the 18th century, very often God was understood as a watchmaker. The cosmos was his watch. The gears worked perfectly harmony. They were harmoniously. They were all in place. They had physical harmony. They had temporal harmony. They had aesthetic harmony and so on and so forth. And then mankind represents the thing within the watch that can deviate the gear or the spring that can go against the whole order of the entire system go against himself, go against God, what have you, and create the conflict. So if we want to identify what the conflict is in Genesis 1 through 3, it's human beings in light of their peculiar nature, because there's something conflictual at the heart of their nature. Let's just go back a moment to our previous slide from our previous lecture, uh, in which relying on Cass, we see clearly the types of questions trying to be answered by these sections of Genesis. A creation myth is determined to ask three questions. What is all this? What's its order? Uh, where, where, what are we? Where do we come from? And how do we relate to all this? Right? And Cass indicates the way in which the questions being asked are divided up uh, by chapter, essentially. And also there's a distinct, not, not only a difference in the nature of the questions, but a, dis, a, a di differentiation in terms of our perspective on the world. Chapter one is almost a completely non-anthropocentric perspective, meaning that the only need it really deals with in terms of human beings is our need a, a, to know and our desire for curiosity to know the world we live in. Uh, Aristotle, in his, in his Metaphysics, book one, he says, uh, human nature, by its very nature, desires to know. Human beings, because they have reason, desire to know simply for its own sake, not for the sake of the practical benefits the knowledge might attain. Right? So here we get these big metaphysical questions or theoretical questions that don't seem to immediately pertain to our everyday lives. Uh, 
crucial to this claim is the impact this perspective has on the creation of Adam and Eve, or in this case, man and woman. And you'll notice in chapter one, we're going to focus specifically on the words used to describe the first human beings. And you'll notice that by chapter two, the words have changed, and that change signifies a transformation in the, or the orientation, or you could say the questions being asked uh, uh, by the text, right? In the first chapter, human being is understood within the context of the whole. It's from a, you might call it a global or universal or transcendent perspective where human beings are seen in the big picture. And you'll notice in the big picture, they're the capstone, but there's virtually nothing you learn about them. And they are really just one more being in the order of things that completes it. And Cass makes the argument, and some might dispute it, but at least as it pertains to chapter one, the reason day six is described as very good is not because uh, God has created this special being man so much as he has created the being that completes the order and is its capstone, right? Nonetheless, God creates man in his own image. So this capstone is a special capstone, no doubt. But still, we learn nothing about that being. In chapters 2 and 3, starting in 2 and 3, we get different characterizations and terminologies for the human being and human nature. There's a very different story being told. And what's crucial, as Cass points out, and I think he's just plainly correct, is that by chapter 2, we're no longer from this cosmological perspective. We're no longer a metaphysician. We're no longer a philosopher wanting to know the nature of things or a cosmologist or an astronomer. We're now like a sociologist or a political or moral thinker who's concerned distinctly with the human realm, the human realm, because in chapter one, we get the totality uh, and, and the human realm just fits into one little niche of the, ta the totality. So chapters two and three are the story that we relate to and they're the story we understand because it's distinctly from our perspective on the ground looking around at the world and seeing what our life is like in practical terms. And therefore it poses moral, social, political, and practical questions. And it's distinctly anthropocentric, which is to say uh, our existence in the world, this environment is seen from the perspective of our, to say something practical is practical. It's seen from the point of view of our basic needs and desires, our basic needs and desires. And you'll see this reflected, as I've said, in the language used to talk about Adam and Eve. And in fact, the words Adam and Eve don't even emerge until well into chapter two. There are other names for these two primordial beings. All right. So what are the two aspects of the structure uh, or the primordial structure of the creation? The two fundamental aspects, one we've said hierarchy, and then the second one is dualism. Hierarchy implies top-down relationships, superiority at the top, something subordinate and less, less worthy, less dignified at the bottom. Heaven, God, earth, man, animals, grass, plants, what have you. But the other is dualities. Dualities. Light and dark, right? Moon and sun man and woman, and, and and typically you would think of dualities as sitting more side by side one another, and we could ask an open-ended question, do these dualities sit side by side, or isn't it not obvious that light is superior to dark, a heaven superior to earth? Um, by the second story, man is presented in a certain way as superior to woman, uh, in that I think it articulates the story of the, the social and political subordination of women to men, right? And, and this is um, really articulating a historical fact of the human species, particularly under the agricultural revolution, where the very concept of the patriarchal family, or not just the concept, the phenomena of it, the reality of it, really takes hold in that men become property owners uh, and they control the destiny of their families. And, you know, likely this has to do with the struggle between the fact that 
women are the ones with the creative powers of birth uh, and that they are the ones who have the greatest, the children have the greatest attachment to the woman. And uh, also there's issues in, in paternity uh, that uh, seem to evolve into a condition in which men or, or uh, men become the dominant figure within the household. Right, and that's all lurking there because you'll notice in, in chapter two that Adam and Eve get married, right? They are no longer male and female. They become man and woman, right? And those are social roles rather than uh, simply uh, in, in relationship to one another. Uh, and, and you know, they become one flesh. They get married, right? Um, okay, so let's just read this, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Right? Really mysterious. Really hard to understand what's being said. I mean, when he creates heaven and earth, that's clear. So like these two entities. But the darkness on the face of the deep, is quite mysterious, and the spirit of God moving over them, like okay, he's doing it, but why? What? What's the? It's it's under very unclear what the significance of any of this is. It's unclear what the deep is, right? You notice that the deep is uh, lowercase, for example. Um, it it doesn't seem to have the identity as day and night and other terms that get capitalized. Um, okay, so God created heaven and earth. So what we're going to start to see is we chant, we move from nothing to something via God. And of course, creation is literally create, making something ex nihilo, bringing something to an exist, in, into existence out of nothing. And what are the two primordial kind of bits of matter or entities that he brings into existence? Heaven and earth, right? So from time in memoriam, human beings have tried to determine the basic substrate of all things, right? So in ancient uh, Greece, they had the, the, f the four bits of matter, earth, wind, uh, fire, and water, right? Very reasonable ideas, right? And then, of course, Democritus had this uh, really kooky idea back in about the 6th century. He said everything is made of atoms. And atom is literally comes from the word to divide. Atom is the thing that is atomos. Tomos means to divide. And atom is something that's undividable. Therefore, if it's undividable, it would be the root. It would be, he calls it um, the beginning of all matter, right? But what he means by beginning is not a temporal beginning. He means something more like it's the foundation. It's the building block of all things. Of course, we discovered in the 20th century that the atom, while it is basically the building block of all things, can be divided into subatomic so to speak, particles, right? So things get kind of messy there. And we discovered that like matter and energy are not fundamentally different and stuff like that. All kinds of interesting complications. Anyway, so he brings these things into existence out of water. And then it seems like these two entities will be the things from which everything else is made. We said creating is bringing something into existence out of nothing. And then, uh, Making is taking what's already there and fashioning it and giving it a structure, right? So here's the big thing. When heaven and earth come into existence, the earth is without form. And we could assume that the heaven is not precisely. So the, the early vision is this like primordial floating mixture of stuff that is in need of order, right? God wants to bring order. Mankind wants to bring order to things. That's what it does. Um, it builds houses. Uh, it it uh, uh, tills the soil and creates canals. Um, it builds structures that are in regular geometric patterns. And intellectually, it wants to bring order or understanding through dividing things up and understanding how they relate to one another. Right. So simultaneously, we're getting an understanding of the structure of the universe, but we're also getting a reflection of the human need to see structure uh, in things, that there is an order to things, right, which can't be taken for granted. Okay, um, so the other thing we notice is that creation is done by separation, which is to say something is separated from nothing, and then we see, for example, that light, uh, dark, is separated from light, 
and day is separated from night and so on and so forth. And this is something that Cass talks about and then we'll, we'll get at in a moment, which is that everything, uh, creation, once the stuff is there, uh, it's done through dividing things. And what happens when you divide stuff? You distinguish, you divide or separate. You distinguish one thing from another. And by distinguishing them, you make them intelligible that they are distinguished in the first place. Because what is the beginning condition of chaos? The beginning condition of chaos or void uh, is something that's undifferentiated or undivided or indistinguishable from itself. It's just like a blob. And the perfect example of this is the water, because we discover that water is in the origins of things, and yet we don't hear any mention of God having created it, because when we hear the word earth, we're not sure if it's just referring to nature in general. We're not sure if it's referring specifically to soil, like undifferentiated soil, the clay that will become the planet Earth. Uh, later on at, at verse 10, Earth gets capitalized, right? So we realize we're talking about not just Earth and dirt, we're talking about the planet that we all live on. That is our home relative to the telling of this story, right? So... Uh, Water is a feature of all these ancient creation myths. And, of course, if we think about water being necessary for life, if we think about water being instrumental in the flood uh, during Noah, and really what you have there it, during the flood of Noah is a return uh, to this undifferentiated state because God is it's often described as a second creation although that time he doesn't start from scratch like this time, right? The water represents uh, this kind of primordial condition of chaos uh, 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 of the order of things, uh, which is to say a lack of order. So water is this perfect um, trope, uh, not only of something that's necessary for life, but of something that you ask the question, well, isn't there a movie? What is the shape called the shape of water? And you ask yourself, what is the shape of water? You could say, what is the shape of a diamond? It has a pretty clear shape. Or what is the shape of a basketball or a tree? Uh, there's many naturally occurring things that have pretty definitive shapes. Um, but water is this wonderful thing that has no shape. And rather, it takes the shape of the container that it's given. So in the beginning, the water is undifferentiated and needs to be given structure and it's this perfect image of the formless the formlessness it's a it's a kind of emblem of the formlessness of the creation so let's keep going and god said let there be light and there was light so you notice god can speak things into existence number one and number two that the word and the thing are really one and the same now notice the difference when adam gets to name the animals here, the word is used first, and it's almost like a magical incantation that brings into existence the thing. Whereas with Adam, the things already exist. They've been made by God, and he just gets to name them after the fact. Here, language is creative. With Adam, language is simply representational or descriptive of the world around it. And of course, that's the relationship we have with language up to a point, right? We could we raise the whole question beginning of the semester uh, in the lecture which is to say, uh, is language merely descriptive or does it have the powers of creation? And we said that uh, not quite in the same way as God, but language certainly has the power to create invisible or non-material or non-empirical entities uh, that, are, that are very powerful and influential over human life. Some of the most important words, right, are not words that simply describe physical realities. Uh, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So God divided the light from the darkness. So we see that creation happens through division, and the division provides structure, and structure provides intelligibility. Intelligibility. If we think about our whole ability to perceive things, the way we perceive things is through comparison and contrast, and the being able to differentiate things in the world. So uh, it stands to reason that if we are able to differentiate the things in the world, it was because God differentiated the things of the world to allow us to distinguish things from that original primordial state. 
So you notice there is night and day, but there is no sun or planet Earth uh, rotating 24 hours full rotation to provide a, what we would think of as a day or what uh, Cass calls a solar day. Um, and God created the light. And God called the light day. So now he's created it and he's just calling it, right? Just like Adam, representationally. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So when he talks about dividing light from dark and night from day, I always think of the, I, I think quite likely that uh, the the uh, the Doors song written by Jim Morrison, The Night Divides the Day, um, is really riffing uh, on this language here. Uh, and And you see that these two exist together. They're really two sides of the same coin, right? Night and day. Uh, necessitate one another. They can't exist without one another. Some of the interesting implications. And that was the first day. And why do we have a first day? Well, we have a first day in, in the universe now, precisely because there is light and dark that alternates to be able to create a first day. Now, what's interesting is there's no sun, right? And there's no earth. And conversely, there is no evidence that the matter has been arranged so the subject that time exists right time is a function of movement if there were no movement in the universe there would be no time right it would be an unintelligible concept because nothing would change and time wouldn't mark time marks change of one kind or another and it's physical change right it's changes of of the material and energy in the cosmos right so here he has light and dark changing but there's no understanding of what's going on with all the matter, all the other stuff, right? But we get a day because we now have light and dark to create that day, right? And so what's also going on here? We're getting the physical differentiations, differentiations of energy and light, but now we're getting differentiations of time and the cycle of time of a day going forward and then the seasons of the year, and then the years passing, and then ultimately of life, uh, birth, life, and death. So this cyclical uh, structure, which is being established here, harkens back to the title, Genesis, or birth, or generation, growth, development, ma maturity. If that which is born matures and dies. Uh and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. The waters above and the waters below is what he's referring to, which makes it elusive because he leaves that out. He could say divide the waters from above and from below. And we'll look at a, a diagram in a moment to see what this looks like. And God made the firmament divide the waters uh, which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. So seven clarifies it. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. So right with these waters floating around the way they're, do they're doing. Uh, there's no place for human beings to inhabit. Like there's no place with a proper atmosphere, with the proper conditions, a, a container in this water for us to live. So what happens is the firmament gets created above to block the waters from above because the waters are everywhere, right? And this undifferentiated state acknowledges that there's no up, down, left, right. Once we have the firmament above and the dry land below, we have the establishment of those kind of cardinal points uh, and... Uh, dimensions, the three dimensions and the cardinal points in the compass and, and an up-down orientation that uh, uh, give us a space in the world, but also orient us uh, directionally and spatially. Uh, we stand upright on the earth. Therefore, we experience everything in an up-down orientation, despite the fact that we know from pictures and evidence and whatnot that the earth is round and that someone can stand upright on the earth at the bottom, and they're facing the opposite direction, but it feels like they're standing upright. So you see, the, the orientation of the creation is from this common sense perspective of the human being standing there. 
and by that I mean imagine if I'm a if I'm a so-called primitive human being thousands of years ago and I see the sun move across the sky it's self-evident to me that the sun is the thing moving across the sky because I see it moving across the sky and I don't feel myself moving right so one way to understand what's going on in the Genesis story that makes it very intelligible is that everything is presented as it appears to us uh, when we walk out the front door without the benefit of a satellite picture from outer space, right, to see what's really going on, right? It's it's an orient matter of orientation and perspective, right? Which is, when we go out the door, what do we see? We see a firmament above, and we see dry land below. We do not see the planet as a globe. We see the planet basically as a horizon, right? And of course, we're the animal who's looking out. We're, we're the animal that has the ability. We're not looking down. We're not face down. We're, we're not on all fours. We're looking out. And when we look out, what do we see? We just see the horizon, but also human beings, we look up. And looking out and looking up are, are essential to this story. They are physical attributes or abilities of human beings, but they have um, they have uh, implications for our psychological outlook, right? That we look out to the rest of the world. We're not simply looking at what's immediately in front of us. And of course, when we look up, it, it could be seen as a metaphor for wanting to understand the bigger picture of things, which is exactly what this story is intent on explaining. So that's the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered unto one place and let there be dry land and let dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, capital E. Now we have a home for human beings. The setting is being developed. And the, ga and the gathering together of the waters called uh, the sea. And God saw that it was good. Notice, notice the accent through the italics. It was good like as it was really good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb. So now that the earth is there, things start growing on it. Do you see the, the rationale of this story? Forget about whether it exactly conforms to the empirical history of the creation of things. It has a really wicked rationale to it that makes sense on its own terms it's very logical, even as it's not empirical, right? Bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, uh, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding, notice the repetition, uh, yielding seed uh, after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be light in the, firm, in the firmament to divide the day from the night. So notice here, day and night are not capitalized. The day and night that we get here are in fact solar days. And you realize that the six days of creation, very definitively, capital D days, you realize very quickly that these are not the same type of day, right? The capital D day is some kind of cosmic day, right? And notice what you're getting now is there's a cosmic day and night and an earthly day and night. You're getting cycles within cycles, right? That's very fascinating. Uh, to divide day for night and let them be signs signs and for seasons and for days and for years so now we have time as we understand it we really didn't have time as we understand it until this moment and notice that these people clearly understand the relationship between the sun and the moon and time uh, as it happens on earth and the seasons of the year that is simply correct right that is accurate and you have to understand these stories come from farmers uh, people who, unlike us, spend significant portions of the year outside and they see these transformations. And over thousands of years, they start to understand very clearly the implications of uh, the change in the seasons uh, as a result of relationships of, to the sun and to the moon. Uh, the sun and the moon literally are 
in the firmament. They're like stuck in this dome that is above us. Uh, and God, here we go, 15. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so, right? So now we have light upon the earth as opposed to light in the beginning. These are not the same things. This first light is something more primordial. It's not even clear that it's light like in the photographic sense of light, right? That's interesting. And that's that becomes very obvious because it talks about uh, light for the earth. Okay. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. So the sun rules over our planet in a certain way by giving light and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So you notice the rhythms set up by the repetition of the structure of the language. Sometimes it just passages repeat. Sometimes the same structure repeats with a slight variation. What is the structure of this language doing? It's repeating, number one, so it in, we internalize this kind of the generation uh, of what's going on here. And then second, it, it is a kind of a verbal parallel to the, to the physical thing that's being described. Right, it's trying to perform what what it describes, and God God said, "Let the waters bring forth abundantly the the moving creatures that hath life and fowl that may fly above earth, in the open firmament of heaven." And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which uh, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl and after his kind. And God saw it was good. So you see here that, um, notice the structure. No, no human beings. Yet. You have plants coming out of the ground, right, from with the help of the water and the sun. And then you get fish and fowl. And then you're going to get cattle and creepy crawly thing. And then in the very middle, you're going to get man, right? So fish close to the, fowl close to the heaven, fish down below the earth in a sense creepy crawly thing right on the earth, and then man erect, right? Um, and they're abundant. So once you see the the flora and fauna, which is fecund, which is flourishing, it's going to be fruitful and multiply, you start to see the harmony, the order of everything, this kind of utopian beginning of all things. And God blessed them which is to say he sanctified them. And that's, of course, a very good thing. He gives them, a, he consecrates them and gives them a kind of special status, right? He acknowledges their dignity and worth, that they're sacred, that they're holy. They're not divine to the level that he is, but nature itself is blessed. Now, when we get to the fall, what is God going to do? He's going to curse the soil. Uh, nature is going to be, it, not just human nature, but nature itself is going to be fallen. It's going to have an increasingly subordinate and lower position, and it will be the source of all the problems in the world, along with human nature. This says, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So it, it's so awkward, you know, and the and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. I mean, the, the grammar is such that it doesn't really make sense to us, but we know we kind of know what's being said. And you can kind of work back from what you know is to be said to start to understand the, the grammatical usage here. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creature, the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing. And the beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. You see how God, when he does something, he, he wants it to happen, and it was so. With human beings, they're going to want to do something, and it's not going to be so, right, uh, by by chapter 3. Also notice that creeping things, which is going to be one of the creeping things on the ground, it's going to be the serpent. And creeping things are close to the earth, therefore they're very associated 
with the terrestrial and earthly realm. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind. It's like we just read this, right? It, it's like, uh, so you see it at 24 here, it says, and God said, let the earth bring forth. So he said it. So this is just like the, the division between 24 and 25. And God said, let there be light, comma, and there was light. There's always two parts to it. There is saying it. And then there's the re, the reality of it within the terrestrial realm, right? Inside the creation, because God exists outside, outside the creation, right? So the reason for the repetition is because the first time he's saying it, and the second time it's being actualized. And you notice some oddity here. It says, and God said, let there be these things. But then at 25, it says, and God made the beast of the earth. Now, previously, when he created light, he didn't say, let there be light. And then he said, God made light. Let there be light. And there was light. So there's an interesting difference and ambiguity here uh, because of that uh, structural distinction. And God saw it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay. And let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Right. So you see this really complex structure sentence structure where the language is flipped on itself and he puts the the subject and the indirect object which is to say god the subject creates adam and eve and this, this the pronouns for the subject and, and and indirect object are put right next to one another and it becomes very complicated but you know what's being said here and it's the same thing three times different ways right Re, uh, reinforcing the significance of this event and in the last iteration of this telling, he no longer speaks simply of man or he. He speaks of male and female, right? So let's go back. The sixth day, human beings as the capstone, uh, let us, us. So God is a Lord, although that word isn't used till chapter two, but he is the royal we. Right. So when he says us, he's not schizophrenic with multiple personalities. No, there are not multiple gods. There is one God who refers to himself in the first person plural. Right. The king uses we and us. It's it's the king's speech. It's the or as we commonly say, the royal we. Man is made in our. So that's still the possessive royal we our own or our image after our likeness, right? And this is reiterated at 27. God, cre God created man in his own image. So notice you move from the first person of God speaking to the third person of the narrator characterizing. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he, meaning God, them, right? Um, so l later in this lecture, we'll have this discussion of what is meant here. But one of the important distinctions between chapter one and chapter two is that in the first creation, they're created in God's image. In the second creation, there is no mention of them being created in God's image. In the second one, they are not godlike. They are not godlike. In fact, picking of the fruit is the instrument, we might say, of them becoming like God, which is to say made in the image of God. So there's a profound difference between the creation story in one and the creation story in two. We'll also note, and then we'll just move on and to our next element here, but dominion, right? Man is in dominion. There is this perfect mirror image of God ruling as a king over the universe in dominion over it, 
which is to say a that dominion is a political uh, notion of rule of sovereignty connoting power connoting political superiority and then mirror image of mankind ruling over the earth in a like way dominion and of course when we look around at the hu human history we we seem to be in dominion over the earth but you'll notice in chapter two and certainly by chapter three that we are not in dominion and diff and how is how does that become clear because there is explicitly different language parallel to dominion that describes a relationship to the earth that is precisely not dominion. So here we look at the creation, and one thing we note about it, God works from top to bottom, and then he gradually works in. And what's the final piece? Mankind. So what do we get out of this structure? What do we mean when it's, we say it's very good? I think some of the primary things we mean is that it establishes an order, a satisfactory, harmonious order. It's harmonious, it's balanced, it's hierarchical. These seem to be natural features that are presented as appropriate to this order. It, it's making a value judgment, you could say, on what type of order this should be, right? Um, within that order are complementary du dualities, light and dark, sun and moon, man and woman. But then the human being will be the one being that in itself is its own duality. And this is going to be create a problem, and it's going to have to do with our voluntary existence, right? We're going to have the power of choice. Human beings having the power of choice means that there is a center of power and authority that is not simply dictated by if if God is like the central government in Washington, D.C., man is down here somewhere out in the States, out in flyover country, and he's got his own authority over, if not everything, to some degree over himself because he can choose, which means he can choose to either follow or to deviate from God's commandment. And that is a form of power, uh, a form of possibility, uh, and also a problem that no other being here exhibits. So here you can take, this is a pretty good representation. There, there are many representations trying to depict what this story looks like. And you notice that, you know, that as far as I know, that uh, there are no actual diagrams coming down from, from biblical times, uh, 1000 BC and so on, uh, of this cosmic order. So people have read this story and inferred from it what they think it looks like, right? But this, this is a basic representation of what you see. The sky above us is actually a rigid structure. It's made from earth. The firmament is made from earth. It's a solid boundary, like a dome, that insulates us from the water above. And when it rains, the floodgates open and the rain pours in. Uh, when springs come up, natural springs underneath us, or there are oceans, that's because there's water underneath pressing up through the earth. And basically, we have this precious little zone this this kind of living room designed for us at this at the center but at the bottom of things uh, for us and so hierarchy is really important hierarchy doesn't just connote a uh, physical structure it connotes a, a, a hierarchy of worth and value as we go up things are of greater power worth and dignity god being superior in the heavens and at the bottom we have uh, we have the deep, Shoel, so, so, uh, Shoel, so here that's described here as being like this nether region beneath the earth. Um, and that is, seems to be a traditional er interpretation of what the deep is, although it's rather just reading it, it's, it remains pretty ambiguous. And uh, mankind is somewhere in the middle, above plants and animals in the earth, but below the divine, right? So we turn out to be the middle being in the order of things right not too much not too little and this means we're a being that ha this is like a caste structure of the cosmos we are a being that ha has a special place but we also have clear limits on what we are and what we can do right one of the things about modern uh philosophical orientation is that mankind is a blank slate it can make itself into whatever it wants 
and uh, through science it will discover the powers to control nature the way God and maybe even create in the way God did. And this story clearly says, no, mankind tries to do those things always. He tries to ascend to the heavens, builds the Tower of Babel, but he will always be subordinate in this order of things. And this is a tremendously powerful message. And it's a very similar message that the Greeks will send. The, the very expression, man as the middle being, is an expression from, from, uh, from the Greeks. Uh, and it serves us well to remind us of our limits and for the ancient world of the fundamentally tragic nature of life. And by that I mean not in the strict uh, literary sense of the word tragic, but that there are things in the world that cause problems that we have no control over. The opposite of a tragic view, I would say, in this understanding of the word tragic, is a view in which we can control everything to solve all the problems, cure all the diseases, and liberate ourselves from all those awful things people had to deal with in the past that we don't have to deal with anymore. Okay, so the structure of the creation, here's my little diagram that's very similar, but it makes it more clear. Heaven at top, nature at the bottom, heaven impinging up here, impinging down, earth coming up, and man caught in between the two. Notice, for example, the fowl are considered kind of more divine. Maybe it's because they can fly. It's something that humans can't do. Fish are stuck imminently in the water, right? And then mankind stands upright here, a synthesis of heaven and earth, uh, earth and, and spirit and so on. And then we see that the serpent will be the creepy crawly thing. Um, and we note that the cosmic order of things will then be reflected in the earthly order. So here I show a diagram that illustrates this structure with God at top, man in the middle, and nature at the bottom, hell at the very bottom, right? But that's not a, clearly indicated in the first three chapters of Genesis, any discussion of something like hell. But you see this order being reinforced in the, in, in the chain, the, literally the great chain of being, at, which is to say that it's all connected and harmonized and, and unified in a structure, right? Now, this is from a book from the 16th century, and what's so great here, I think I showed this in the other video, is that this order was understood for thousands of years to be reflected in the social order. If you think of the very concept of the divine right of kings, it signifies the divine power granted by God to a king that then structures society hierarchically, because there's one person at the very top, and they're put at the top, apparently, by the will of God, right? Um... So the notion that the social order was really just an expression of the cosmic order or God's will is really part and parcel of almost every major religion, right? And therefore, this was to get you to accept the order as is and that there wasn't mobility. What the, the place that you're born into is the place where you're going, where you come from is where you're going. Of course, our modern, particularly American, egalitarian, democratic outlook is that the order is not fixed. Yes, there's a hierarchy. Yes, I mean, there's no there's no society that doesn't have hierarchy. We're not, not going to be foolish here, right? Unless, of course, um, you want communism. Uh, but I've never seen an egalitarian communist nation. You see the party at top, uh, uh, an oligarchic elite, and everybody else at the bottom uh, suffering greatly. So uh, in our American attitude, Right, where you what you're born into is not where you're going. DNA is not destiny. Color of your skin is not destiny, right? And um, I mean, partly that's made true simply because we maintain that belief and we live with it and we pursue it. We pursue that way, right? So we have this expression uh, as above, so below. Meaning, uh, God established a hierarchy above; He's the Lord up there. And then on the planet, what do we have? We have kings ruling over everyone else the way God rules over the creation. Once we see the order of things created and made, Cass distinguishes another layer of, uh, of structure that is lurking underneath uh, what's been described, which is that creation is by separation, but he sees a kind of thematic or categorical way in which things have been separated 
that have to do with principles of separation rather than specific objects that are being created, although, of course, they relate to those uh, specific objects. So we have a separation of something from nothing. We have uh, a separation of place from non-place. Once you have heaven and earth and dry land and things like that, what, what happens? Uh, dry land and the firmament. You have spatial orientation and you have structure to things that provide place. In the beginning, you have something, but it's all undifferentiated, so it doesn't have distinct regions because there's nothing to differentiate those regions. When you have the firmament and dry land, you have those regions that establish place. Uh, then motion. How is motion created? It's from the displacement or separation of a thing from one place to another. So that's when you have the moon and the sun that move, because nothing else moves until the moon and the sun. Nothing else moves, and those become the markers of time. And of course, in the ancient world, like ancient Mesopotamia, who were great astronomers, uh, and cosmologists that they understood the seasons very well and uh, eventually could predict things like uh, uh, eclipses and whatnot because of their knowledge of the way in which motion marks out time. Then you move from motion to locomotion, which is motion is displacement of a thing. It's first it's here and then it's separated from itself in a sense from that place to another place. Locomotion is internal motion. So you see that things that move uh, like the sun and the moon, function on external laws of motion. But locomotion, like an we're talking about animals here, plant, uh, well, mostly animals. Um, plants grow, but they don't really move. They're, they're, they're rooted, right? Um, locomotion is self-motion, where the, the source uh, or the cause of motion is internal rather than external. Then we get human action. And human action connotes not just motion but voluntary motion and we don't think of our when we think of action we think of life we don't conceive of ourselves as moving we conceive of ourselves as living and acting movement is based on something instinctual and involuntary animals hardwired action uh, and also and in relationship to concepts of pleasure and pain whereas action is based on concepts of good and bad, right and wrong, just and unjust. The guideposts for the animal are simply pleasure and pain. The guideposts that direct us on our path through human life are good and bad, which is to say characterizations of pleasures and pains. Some pleasures are bad and, uh, and some pains are good for us. So our action and our movement does not simply line up with following pleasure and avoiding pain because we are willing to accept certain pains because we have the foresight to see that they are beneficial to us. You know, like brushing our teeth or going to the gym or taking our vitamins uh, or eating cereal that doesn't taste that great, what have you. Or, or making some kind of major sacrifice because we think it's the right thing to do. Voluntary motion is the great liberation. You could say it's free will without getting into deep meanings about what that implies. Clearly, from the common sense view, we live a life of choice. We realize that we can reflect on our actions and do something different that, other than what we did, or do something different that we did last time. We tried something out last time, it didn't work. We reflect on that, we say, no, I don't think I'm going to do that again. I'm not going to make that mistake again. That's voluntary action. Of course, this raises interesting, profound questions about determinism. If the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology are ironclad, what does it mean to say, what does, it, what does it mean when we say human beings have freedom, given that our bodies, as we know, are subject to the same material laws as everything else, right? Unless you want to posit some magical soul in there that miraculously um, alters that physical equation. But that would be called a miracle. So this list is similar, but it's a little different. It deals with the order and its movements, and it focuses on not the aspect of separation and division, uh, which leads to creation, but more specifically the different principles at work and the different types of beings, right? So you get, nothing, you get something from nothing, and then you get space and matter, or you could say the dimensions of time and space. 
you get place, you get motion, and know that motion of the planets is has an external cause, it's physical laws, locomotion are internal laws of chemistry and biology, and human action is called by caused by internal laws, but they are moral laws. The big problem with moral laws is that unlike laws of physics, chemistry, and biology, moral laws can be broken. And when something can be broken, it will be broken. Okay, so as we round third and head toward home, but just reiterate this, you can see that that what is being characterized in a very strategic way in this uh, in Genesis and Cass really brings to light is the distinction in these three principles of motion. Remember, this is a watch. It's all ticking away on various laws that God has created, given it. But we have a law, and it's a moral law. And the one law we've been given is don't pick from the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. That is our one law. Therefore, it is good to not eat it and bad to pick it. Apparently, right? There's some interesting ambiguities there. The point is, God has not put any uh, physical prevention from picking the fruit. He says don't do it, but the only uh, element is the prohibition he's given. Of course, there will be consequences, but the consequences happen after the fact rather than before the fact. There's no wall around that tree to prevent us physically, except for our rational foresight about the consequences. But Adam and Eve in their animal state at the beginning of uh, in chapter 2, there's no notion of them being able to have rational foresight. It seems that rational foresight is really a product of, of this, their state of exile. They become aware of things only after they pick the fruit. But let's just be clear, the, the moral laws which can be broken that we function on have to do with notions of good or bad, good and evil, beneficial and harmful, just and unjust perception versus reality, right? We perceive something to be the case, could be something else. Which is to say, we perceive something as good or bad, but it might not be good or bad. Central question with Eve is, she perceives that the fruit is yummy, and the serpent is influencing her perception, but what is the truth about the fruit? And even after she picks it, it's not very clear we should say. Um, when I say moral laws, I just simply mean characterizations of good and bad, right? Um, human beings, there is no society that does not function on rules or laws uh, that establish notions of this is good and this is bad, that in which we lay on top of the phenomena or the thing a, con a moral concept of good or bad, good and evil, harmful. Uh, beneficial, just, or unjust. So the problem for man, we are the fly in the ointment. We are the thinker who doesn't just think, we act on our own perceptions. And our perceptions can be faulty. We live a voluntary, a life of voluntary motion based on choice. And moral choice is based on perceptions of the categories of right. Perceptions is important of right and wrong, good and bad, good and evil, and so on. The central principle of human nature, unlike the nature of anything else, is that it is variable. We have choice, and our locus of agency is internal, and therefore it is independent from God. Right? The moon functions on laws that God made. God has given us a law, but there's obviously an extent that we can give ourselves our own law of action by choosing contrary to God. Right? That is a dilemma, that is a conundrum, and that, my friends, is a conflict. Okay. So we're the fly in the ointment, or the wrench in the gears of the watch, precisely because we're the only being in the cosmos that doesn't have its life spelled out to it in advance. Choice raises a profound problem. Choice based on what? How are we to decide what to do? Because the basic question here is how to live. How should we act? Action. How to live? Uh, what is the basis of what we choose? The basic playing field that the Bible presents is reason versus faith. Reason versus faith. And the serpent seems to be a manifestation of our reasoning. And faith has to do with a certain um, uh, a, a kind of innocent 
trust in God, despite the fact that what he's saying doesn't seem to always add up. Are you choosing, and here's the other problem of a life of choice, if, if this is what defines us as human beings, even in the Genesis story, are you choosing if you always follow God's prohibitions and rules? Right? Especially for Adam and Eve in the beginning, when they're proto-humans. Uh, are you living a distinctly human existence if you are dogmatically following the rules you have been given in advance? Right? Think about that. So we are the only beings in the cosmos that doesn't have its life uh, spelled out. Uh, must we choose in order to be human? Mustn't we transgress in order to choose? Choosing itself in the context of the prohibition, because that's the big choice we have in this, as presented in the story. The choice we have is to transgress and pick the fruit, right? Because that's the one thing we've been told not to do. Everything else we can do, we don't have to choose. We just do it, right? So mustn't we transgress in order to choose, or isn't choice in this case a fundamental, by its very nature, a fundamental uh, act of transgression against God's will? Now, these are questions. I'm not answering them. Does God want us to do this? Now, that's, that's a perverse thought, right? Because you think the basic notion of faith in God means you abide by what God says. Mankind seems to be a walking contradiction. Uh, and who, who makes this history? Is it man or God? Right? Human beings feel they can make their own history because they have choice. Whether they can is another question. So here I'm, I'm not going to read all these because... Uh, we'll spend time talking about these in class. But these are the two decisive sections in chapter 1 on one hand and in chapter 2 that spell out the differences in the treatment of the creation of Adam and Eve. As we finish up, I don't want to spell out the implications of everything here, but lay out some key signposts on the road here. In chapter 1, human beings are made. They are not created. It would stand to reason that things that are created have a more special status than things that are merely made, right? There's something more miraculous in the process. Making is something that human beings do. Of course, one thing, God makes life. But the thing is, unlike a female of any species, he doesn't make life from previously existing life. He makes life from non-life, right? Adam is kind of a Frankenstein monster. Um, so he still does something miraculous. But we are made, not created. That's the language of Genesis. Uh, human beings are made in God's own image and likeness. This is what differentiates us. What does that mean? I ask you now, what is God's image and likeness? Does this mean his physical? I mean, God doesn't have a physical when we think of likeness or image, we think of a representation of someone uh, being physically like. That's clearly, it can't simply mean that, right? Um, what would that mean? God, God is not embodied in the way we're embodied. Like, if he had a human body, he'd have all the limitations that come with it. So that's almost unintelligible. Uh, notice they are not called, spelling error here, they're not called Adam and Eve, but simply male and female. Well, what does that connote? Uh, all, all mammals, for example, are male and female. They're just animals here. They're not being presented as human beings as we understand them, with all their social, political, moral uh, roles that we could think of. Uh, importantly, they are made simultaneously at the same time. And it seems like in creation one, we'll call it, that Adam and Eve, or man and woman, male and female, are equals. But notice, in, in one, there's no social world, right? So, chapter two seems to be saying something very interesting when they take on their social roles, and Eve is subordinated to Adam. It seems to say, by nature, men and women are, made e are created equally. That's chapter one. They're endowed by, they're created equal. In chapter 2, it seems to suggest that the subordination of women is not a function of nature in its original, but is rather necessitated by social order. Now that might answer, that answer might not satisfy you, but that seems to be what's being said, right? 
um, we're not going to make the Bible politically correct. If we disagree with it, that's fine. But, you know, th that would be absurd. We might as well just read, you know, Marx or something instead of reading the Bible if we're interested in something like that. Um, Eve stands alongside Adam as an equal and is not derived from him and his needs. In the second one, man is alone. And then, you see, he needs somebody, so he goes gets a, you know, a Barbie doll or something, right? Um, Eve is not, er, the, the female here is not presented as a, a product of mankind's needs, right? Or, excuse me, the man's needs. So in the second creation, there's some interesting little things here. First, it said that earth is sitting there, fecund, but there's not a man to till the ground. There's not a farmer. Well, why does the earth need a farmer, right? And you notice in, in chapter 2, it's not clear what, God, what Adam and Eve do in the garden. I don't think they have sex in the garden. They're living eternally. They, have, they pick from the, the fruit of the tree of life, right? So they, they don't need to work because the fruit is, everything's growing. Right, the, the 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 farmer part comes in chapter three when they get exiled. Then man needs to become a farmer, and he explicitly says, "You will make, uh, you will get bread from the sweat of your brow." This wonderful expression. Apparently, however, the earth needs man for work, and man is formed or made of dust. He comes from the earth. He's connected with it. Think about farmers; they they're rooted in the soil, in almost literally, figuratively. Um, he's made from the earth and the breath of life. And therefore, heaven and earth conjoined in this being in which it's oil and vinegar, and they never perfectly mix. And he's finally called it Ad Adam uh, in uh, chapter 2, verse 19. But we should be clear, Adam is an ambiguous name. Number one, Adam and Eve represent universal, prototypical human beings, the archetypal human beings. They're not individuals. Adam is not even a proper name. Um, and Adam uh, is Adama, which means soil, right? So in the name for the first human is that we come from this terrestrial realm. Eve is the product, presented as the product of man's social needs. It's not good for man to be alone. Then Eve is, Eve is made derivatively from Adam. Some inter interesting implications of this, which is say Adam is separated from himself process of creation by separation or making by separation they are now known as man and woman which is to say social roles and they establish the institution of marriage and they become one flesh so what happens eve is separated out from adam and then adam is returned or mended into one flesh as he marries eve and then of course they produce a child right and they produce more than one but they produce a child uh eventually through sex and literally the child represents the one flesh that they both the two contributed to uh, and then notice the very last verse of chapter two because this foreshadows where things are going where the story is going they are naked and they are not ashamed and they're of course not even aware of not being ashamed because it's not even on their radar right but of course, what happens in chapter three, they pick the fruit and the first thing they recognize, the first thing is their nakedness. Now, that's interesting of all the things that they could have recognized. So what is one of the ultimate implications of these creation stories? And in some sense, they do have some important overlap. And the important overlap is they both present man as this middle being that is a dual or complex being that within its or his or her own nature is the source and the cause of the problem. It's, it's the source of our distinct dignity, but also the cause of the problem. In chapter one, we're presented as the image of God, imagedite, made in the likeness. And the second, we have the spirit of God in us, right? Which is, is not something fundamentally different. We have a spark of God that nobody else has. No other being in the creation except us. But here's the problem, and here's the conundrum. Uh, and what a likeness is by definition a dual-natured thing in the same way to be made of soil and spirit is to be dual-natured, right? Um, to be made an image of God or his likeness is to be God-like. 
an image or likeness is a derivative representation of a thing it both is like or it both is and it is not the original or it is both like and not like the original therefore mankind is both like and not like god we are the middle being we are above the plants and animals in a superior position or in dominion over the earth as god is in heaven but we are also not god in heaven nor by chapter two is our dominion over the earth so obvious it is it is not clear whether we're in dominion over the earth but rather subordinate and servile to it as farmers and gardeners so in chapter one we're in dominion over the plants and animals in the earth and in chapter two we are placed to dress and keep the garden and that actually sounds like we're um, conservators uh, uh, of of nature we have an obligation to it not just to dominate it and use it and exploit it but to be caretakers of the planet thank you